one of the world's finest heroes. Snuffed out by this. Hello everyone, I am Flick, you probably don't know me and that isn't important right now. Fairly recently I finished playing through Rocksteady's Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League and have since felt compelled to share the pain of this appalling, albeit short, experience with others. It really is remarkable that from a studio with such a high pedigree, this is what we ended up with a whole decade after their last game. It's burying the lead somewhat, but I will say that I've had more fun trying to work out where it all went wrong with this dumpster full of aborted, half-finished ideas and lazy, strung-together, incoherent mess of a plot than I ever did while playing through it. On that note, I should make it clear that I will mainly be focusing on the story of the game in more detail than is perhaps comfortable, because I feel like, given how bad everything else is surrounding the game, not enough of a discerning eye has really taken apart this cavalcade of poor choices it dares to call a plot. There are plenty of videos addressing issues with the story, along with the rest of the game of course, but not necessarily any that give the story the fair shot of working within the game's own inner logic. Just because something contradicts an established fact in a movie, comic or other canon source, it isn't inherently a bad or wrong thing. It can do things differently, it just has to do them better, or at least well. This is what I have become obsessed with and why I'm making this video specifically about this topic. I want to meet the game on its own terms story-wise and see if we can pick apart why it just doesn't work using some very basic trains of thought and logic. I'm not a particularly apt storyteller, I'm not a well-experienced writer of fiction. If I can spot these catastrophic problems we're going to talk about in this video then so can anyone. Anyone except the people who wrote it, it seems. Oh, and before I forget, a general warning that this is going to spoil the entire game. Don't watch it if that's going to be a problem. This might end up being a bit of a long video as well, I'm not sure. But before we delve into the story, I do want to mention gameplay just briefly because I worry that the footage I'm going to use in the background of this video while I blather might mislead you accidentally. Outside of the full playthrough, which I streamed on my Twitch channel and will be linked below, I went and recorded some miscellaneous city exploration and some combat mixed in with just some background visuals for the video, among other things. Looking back at the footage and while researching other people playing, I realised that from the outside looking in, it doesn't necessarily look that bad. It can look acceptable, it can look like any old generic looter shooter, FPS drops aside. The exploration and each character's traversal mechanics can look neat, and the general gameplay loop on display might create thoughts like, that looks fine, what's the big deal? Please stop any such thoughts right there. Playing this game is a chore. Watching it be played creates a better impression than actually playing it. The game assaults the senses with constant chatter, bizarrely intrusive visual effects, and a desperate desire to conceal how horribly repetitive, even by looter shooter standards, it is. Yes, I'm aware you can tweak settings to turn off certain visual noise like damage numbers, but I'm playing this as, presumably, the developers intended, so that's what you're seeing. I played through entirely solo, never changing from playing as Captain Boomerang since his traversal style appealed most, and I can only imagine how much worse it would have been with four players in co-op, all with their own effects going off, trying to have a conversation over the constant, incessant, desperate noises and flashes the game abuses your eyes and ears with as it begs for your attention. Thankfully, the game is also so easy on normal difficulty that if you want to ignore the vast majority of mechanics, it desperately parades out to make you forget that there's only two mission types for its 9-10 to 10 hour runtime, you can. The only thing you need to use is the counter shot mechanic. If you see an icon appear around enemies that looks a little like the counter symbol from the Arkham games, you press a different shoot button and you shoot them with, I don't know, really, a different kind of bullet. The game explains the mechanic in terms of what you do when you see the symbol appear, but not really what you're actually doing when you do it. I guess shooting at precisely the right time throw the enemy's aim off? It doesn't explain why it looks like a blue laser, and maybe you're shining a laser sight right into the retinas, which would still be more enjoyable than playing this, incidentally. If I got a new gun or grenade or shield or whatever, with green arrows pointing up, meaning it was better than whatever I was currently using, then I equipped it. If I got a skill point, I mostly just spent it at random, and I never felt any stronger no matter what I picked. I felt exactly the same as when I finished the game as when I started. There was no sense of progression at any point, only stagnation, which is a bit of a theme with the story when we eventually get to that. 
One last thing, I'm not sure, despite playing as him for the whole game, whether the slot machine that would appear above my head as Captain Boomerang was a result of a gun I had equipped, or a skill I'd picked, or what it even did when certain results in the slot machine popped up. I'm not joking. Please tell me what it was doing. I am genuinely curious. Two mission types are recycled for main and side missions with only slight tweaks. You either kill waves of enemies or you escort a thing. There is literally nothing else outside of Riddler races and boss fights that all boil down to use the counter shot mechanic. The game has nothing else to play with. I can't stress this enough. It has nothing else. So that about does it in regards to gameplay. At best it was bland, at worst it's the kind of assault on the senses that in D&D would cause 2d6 worth of psychic damage. Not enough to worry about, but still enough to be a bother. Let's move on to the story. We should begin, as the game does in both a figurative and literal sense, with Arkham. Whether or not you truly believe this game was meant to be in the Arkham game universe from day one is your own business. Whether you noticed that such connections to the Arkham universe are only ever made via incidental dialogue or interior locations that are dislocated from the main metropolis hub in which the game takes place is neither here nor there. The game at least pretends to be in an established video game universe, and so this forms part of its internal logic upon which we are going to judge and critique it. This is a world where Arkham Asylum, City and Night all happened. Whether or not you also count tangential connections such as Origins, Origins Blackgate, or Assault on Arkham, doesn't really matter. Those main three games happened and Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League picks up around five years after Scarecrow forced Batman to reveal himself as Bruce Wayne to the world. Argus, led by Amanda Waller, are seen going to Arkham Asylum in the beginning of the game in order to recruit criminals into Task Force X, aka the Suicide Squad. This alone, if we take this game as canon to those that came before it, is confusing. The last time we saw Arkham Asylum was in the finale of Arkham Knight. Scarecrow brings Batman to the old asylum, long since shut down since before Arkham City was even created by Hugo Strange, as a symbolic place to end the mythos of the Batman. It is seen in a heavy state of disrepair and is clearly no longer being used. While it isn't impossible that in the space of five years the asylum was reopened, it seems incredibly unlikely. Why would they do this? In a world established now to have Flash, Superman, Wonder Woman, would it not make more sense to imprison supervillains in a city that has a literal superhero or a god? Who would even be running a newly reopened Arkham Asylum? Quincy Sharp is reported to have committed suicide in Arkham Knight, Hugo Strange is dead after what happened in Arkham City, and who would even want to work there after the Joker incident in Arkham Asylum? Many of the big name supervillains for which Arkham Asylum even existed in the first place are dead or gone. The Joker is dead, Mr. Freeze is presumed dead, Black Mask is dead, Poison Ivy is presumed dead, though more on her later, Ra's al Ghul is dead, Clayface is dead, Scarecrow is irreparably brain damaged by his own fear toxin which is confirmed in this game later on, and the list goes on. We also have to remember how Arkham Knight leaves off the stories of the additional Bat family members. Nightwing is staying in Gotham, at least for a while, before returning to Bloodhaven. Now married, Robin and Oracle are working as vigilantes together, still within Gotham, and presumably Red Hood is still out there somewhere murdering criminals. The very first scene of this game already feels tacked on. In reality, it would have made much more sense for the Suicide Squad to be recruited from within Blackgate Prison especially given that in a post credit scene in Arkham Origins, which, yes, I'm aware, was a lead-in to a cancelled version of a Suicide Squad game that never came to be, you see Amanda Waller doing precisely that with Deathstroke, who is going to be DLC for this game further down the line, by the way. But no, it's Arkham Asylum because that's a thing you remember. Because it's a good game you remember. This is the Harley you've seen in those other games, now a bit older and completely different from when you last saw her, and don't worry about Deadshot not being the right race, we'll cover that later as well. The most accidentally poignant moment of this opening scene is when the Suicide Squad are zapped by Waller and collapse into convulsing, gibbering morons on top of the old Arkham logo. This is your new set of characters. The game will make no effort to make you like any of them, but here we are. The Suicide Squad is formed and their mission begins. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is primarily set within Metropolis, sister city to Gotham, and the polar opposite in terms of looks and style, along with the general vibe. 
Metropolis traditionally looks more retro futuristic than Gotham and has a warmer, brighter, hopeful feel, mimicking the characteristics of Superman that would clash with the constant darkness and rain and horribleness that fits Batman's aesthetic better. You may remember that Arkham Knight goes out of its way to set up quite a few things about Metropolis and Superman. This is not in service of this game that we ended up with, however. Rock said he wanted to make a Superman game after concluding the Arkham trilogy. That's why Superman suddenly exists within the universe, why you see posters of him, you hear goons talking about him. It's why there's a phone message from Lex Luthor to Bruce Wayne as a little easter egg in Wayne Tower. The true reasons why Rocksteady were not allowed to make this Superman game or any of the other field projects over the decade it took us to get this garbage, such as a Damian Wayne focused game, may never be known. Suicide Squad builds from the wreckage of this and other failed ideas that never came to fruition. It's established within the logic of the game that they claim to be in the same universe as that Superman does exist and has done for at least long enough to become well known, but he and Batman do not know each other. Later on we'll talk about Superman and Batman meeting because Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League does actually explain how this happens. The timing of it does start to fall apart a little the more you look at various time frames and established facts involved, but whatever. Five years after Arkham Knight, in a world which now has a Justice League comprised of only five noble members, whatever, and on the day of a celebration in Metropolis, focused solely around those five members, Brainiac arrives, he invades Earth, he is planning on terraforming it into a version of his homeworld, and the game picks up with the Sue Squad arriving within the city roughly, actually maybe exactly, three weeks after the invasion started. Via audio logs that just kind of get unlocked as you play through the game and from audio collectibles you find in the world that look like distorted time and space, you learn a lot about the day Brainiac appeared and how monumentally stupid the Justice League were. We'll get to that soon though, don't worry. What we're left with is Metropolis as the playground for the game. It looks flat and weirdly bland despite the awful garish statues to the various League members strewn throughout the city. The balloons and such can be forgiven, there was a city-wide celebration happening on the day of the invasion but architecture can't be. Remove the alien skull ship looming over the city and it still doesn't look like a nice place to live. I said we wouldn't focus on much else besides story related things so we'll leave it at that. Aliens invade on a day of celebration and the League are presumed dead or converted to Brainiac's side. We're also expected to believe that it takes Brainiac three weeks to capture or convert into alien creatures or kill 99% of the population of the city or at least the portion of the city that is cordoned off. The last 1% must be really good at hiding, I guess, because even Batman can't find them. The portion of Metropolis in which the game is set isn't really that big, but oh well, turn brain off, shoot lots of purple things. I think it's about time we talk about the members of the Suicide Squad and all their bland, confused glory. They experience no growth or development through the entire affair. The game lies to you that the lesson learned in the end is work as a team, which is utter nonsense with no attachment to reality. The game conveys no messages, no morals, no real plot. They hang unfunny jokes on scenes without any mind to character growth development or tone. These are four largely unlikable characters with whom you spend the entire pointless journey with nothing to root for and nothing to hope for. These arseholes who are surrounded by even larger arseholes are our primary window into a world that the game wants us to invest in and man is that rough. I tried to find good characters to latch onto I swear but when even random NPCs spout horrible and sometimes truly bizarre garbage like questioning the legality of the squad's guns there is little to no hope. This is bleak, this is devoid of the basic core of storytelling no matter how hard you search. You look through shit and all you find is more shit as you dig deeper into this gaping hole of a game like your reclonic irrigation pipe shoved directly inside Rocksteady's prolapse rectum. Still, we do have ourselves a suicide squad so let's at least focus on them for now. King Shark is the most likeable of the squad, hell, maybe even the most likeable character in the game. He's consistently polite, he's stoic, he's well read and strangely gentle for someone I presume to be a horrible murdering serial killer. He's also the only one in the game that has any believable chance against a superpowered mind controlled hero because he himself is a meta human and has superpowers. He would jump like the Hulk and swim through the air somehow, not in actual water though which is hilarious and he has a reasonable degree of endurance and super strength. You see the game doesn't really establish the crimes of the Suicide Squad, they presume you know Harley's history from the Arkham games which we'll get to 
and you probably know that Deadshot is an assassin. For King Shark and Captain Boomerang, it's kind of just left to your imagination. Besides a couple of throwaway lines that imply King Shark eats humans and one incidental dialogue exchange where I heard him laugh in a sort of evil manner, he doesn't really give off the vibes of a heartless, self-centered villain. They've clearly copied his personality from the Marvel character Drax, meaning much of the humour around him involves not understanding sarcasm and taking everything literally, which adds to the childlike quality about him. This mimics how he's portrayed in the most recent live-action Suicide Squad movie too, but in that it's offset by also showing his bloody violent side. Yes, he is adorable, but he is also a violent cannibalistic beast. In Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, with the chosen personality that they've given him, it also puts the player at odds with the rest of the cast, be it the squad members, Amanda Waller, Brainiac, the Justice League. They all treat him like utter shit. He does nothing to ever deserve the treatment we see him receive, and if he is treated that way because of the horrible things he's done in the past, you have to make us aware of that since there's no previous appearance in the universe the game uses that explains it. King Shark stood out to me both because he was the only character besides one other, and maybe not the one you're thinking of, that I felt anything for, but also because of how at odds he is with the world around him. He's a villain, and everyone treats him like he's killed their favourite pet, but the game just expects us to run with this notion despite presenting nothing to back it up. A scene or two of him revelling in the murder of humans or laughing at the death of heroes would have done this, but it also would have made him as unlikable as everyone else. He's there to be the voice of reason, to be the straight man, or the butt of the joke, as needed, and his reward for that is for everybody to hate him. Next up, let's briefly talk about Captain Boomerang, who I played the entire game as, but about whom I have the least to say. He is annoying. His character traits include putting himself above others, cowardice, throwing boomerangs, stupidity, being Australian, and having a giant penis. What? I thought the game was going to do something with a through line of cowardice turning into bravery like the lion from the Wizard of Oz, but the only setup and payoff we have for his character is that at the start of the game he is painting a picture of himself pissing on the Flash's corpse, and later on he gets to do just that. Boomerang is the idiot of the group. He is there to be stupid. He is there to say a funny thing or to be laughed at because he wasn't listening. He trips over a lot. That's, that's it, but that's his purpose. I really don't know what else I can say about him. He has a vendetta against the Flash because, presumably, the Flash put him in jail once or twice. It isn't really fleshed out, which is a running theme through the whole game. It acts like there's these huge rivalries between these villains and heroes that led to the villains having true contempt for their nemesis, which then lets them truly celebrate the hero's death as a villain victorious. But it isn't there. Aside from Harley, the background is just air, which doesn't make any of this believable. And it isn't as if she really celebrates Batman's death when that happens, but more, a lot more, on that later. It would derail me from the main point of this video to talk too much about gameplay, but I must say that Captain Boomerang favouring shotguns and sniper rifles instead of, I don't know, his boomerangs, is sheer idiocy and laziness on the developer's behalf. Guns are interchangeable between characters, and that makes it easy to add more characters. There can't have been much more thought to it than that. Still, let's leave the captain here and return to him later with specific actions he does during the story. Harley Quinn is the next squad member I want to talk about. Arkham Harley, allegedly. We last saw her inside a cell in the base Batman uses in Arkham Knight, still angry at him and emotionally unstable after seeing all the Joker blood infected characters die. Given she's back in jail, or an asylum, at the start of this game, I guess she either had a mental breakdown or just enjoyed doing crimes even without her precious Mr. J. She is a normal human, no superpowers, and in every single Arkham game was beaten by pressing a single button. It's at this point you've really got to question Amanda Waller's sanity when Harley Quinn is top bill for people to fight an evil Justice League. Yes, she's in the movies, yes, she's in the Suicide Squad comics, but without an insane amount of suspension of disbelief, what is she really going to do against any of the League? Why not get Deathstroke, or Killer Croc, or dig up Solomon Grundy's body from the ruins of Arkham City? Actual metahumans with special abilities that would give them a fighting chance against superheroes. Of course we know the reasons. Harley is recognisable, and she's got to do that weird girl boss thing. I'm not going to pretend to understand it. I don't think she comes across as empowering throughout the story, by the way. She's as brain dead as everyone else. She has no growth. And, well, 
there is a sort of subplot with her falling in love with Wonder Woman, I guess. She does also get to have her revenge against Batman, which is a whole other thing. Harley is easily the most well-known of the playable characters, yet she feels the most empty. She is there because she is Harley Quinn, not because she is useful. She steals Batman's glider and grapple gun to use to get around within game terms, yet can jump off a building and land on the ground without a scratch. Suspension of disbelief really only goes so far, and with her it isn't nearly far enough. Batman to all points. I could use some air support, since I can't fly at all. A final note on Miss Quinn for now is that as much as I love Tara Strong's voice for Harley, I even have an Arkham City poster signed by her, there's something off about her performance in this game. Most of the time she didn't really sound like her old self and I can't quite put my finger on why and I don't think it's just because it's been a decade. It might be the words themselves, there's hints of her here and there, like when she confidently murmurs mm-hmm to Superman, but the rest of the time there's something missing, there's no soul. Lastly we have sort of Deadshot. Via in-game audio logs and the multiversal nature of some of the plot twists revealed later, it becomes apparent that this Deadshot is not from this universe. He is from a universe where he gave up his life as an assassin for the sake of his daughter. Somehow, and that's a big somehow since we never get told the specifics, he found himself in the Arkham universe, this claims to be said in, and becomes angry when he sees what he believes to be a copycat pretending to be him and using the Deadshot name. He comes out of retirement to kill the man he thinks is impersonating him, and succeeds. What? Yep, that's right. Via audio logs only, it is revealed that the Deadshot we know from Arkham Origins, Arkham Origins Blackgate, Assault on Arkham, and Arkham City is dead. This is Deadshot now, and despite the different skin tone, shares the exact same DNA of the one that existed in the universe before, which is what gets him put in jail by Green Lantern, also probably the murder. This also spawns a hatred inside Deadshot of specifically Green Lantern. He places the blame of being separated from his daughter on the hero, which I guess was meant to create conflict specifically between those two. They do seem to especially hate each other in cutscenes, which is a little uncomfortable if you think about it too hard. But like most things in the game, it amounts to nothing of substance and doesn't really change anything once Deadshot does get his revenge. It doesn't make sense that on both sides they seem to hate each other to the degree they seemingly do. I really do wonder why the decision was made to make him black in this game when it is established in previous games that he's white, because if it was to set him apart from the Arkham Deadshot, they already did that by giving this one heterochromia. The being from another universe angle only being stated in audio logs and the first cutscene in the asylum, which itself feels kind of out of place, makes a very convincing argument for this existing to yada yada away a reason for this change. If, and let's pretend here, this game originally wasn't in the Arkham universe, it wouldn't have mattered if they decided Deadshot was black. Maybe Bumper Robinson was just the right person for the role. However, if this was a decision made somewhere in development that they need to make it set in the Arkham universe to make it sell better, it does feel like this would be a quick and easy fix that doesn't take much work. Ah, just get the actors to say this. He killed the white version and then he got put in jail. Job done. And that's our team. These are our four anti-heroes, all of them utterly empty as characters. A shark with a big gun, two dudes with smaller guns, and Harley Quinn, she also has guns. So what about the fallen heroes themselves? What about the Justice League? Well, you get five of them in this game with no indication of any others existing. No Aquaman, no Martian Manhunter, Green Arrow, Hawkman, Hawk Girl. Nope. You get five, and that is it. Later on in this video, I'm going to go into more detail about probably all of the League characters, so we'll just keep this as a quick overview and what led up to where the game begins. You see, it relies on Superman being unyieldingly, stupendously, outrageously stupid. No! Ah! On the day Metropolis is going to celebrate their wonderful Justice League, that called this city their home, the only one of whom we know a great deal about within the universe being Batman, a huge skull ship appears in the air above the city with tendrils, claws, weapons, and purple smoke that couldn't scream villain any louder than Amanda Waller does when she's screeching I'm your daddy now, which really happens by the way. <laughs> via audio logs, man they sure do love shitting out exposition via those don't they? 
Remember in Arkham Asylum when they used them to provide glimpses into the history of the setting or the poignant send-off by Hugo Strange at the site of Batman's parents' murder in Arkham City? No? Anyway, via audio logs we hear the League discussing Brainiac's appearance and apparent desire to... talk. Have a nice old chat with the master of the skull-faced ship. To most of the League, although I'll be honest I don't really remember Green Lantern talking during any of these audio files, they don't trust Brainiac. But because he's an alien too, Superman wants to give him a chance. This is very jarring for a lot of reasons. Superman is not an idiot. There is a difference between believing in the best in people and having childlike naivety. Yet here he is presented as strong arming the League into going to Brainiac's ship because it's the polite thing to do. Batman even shouts at him that it's obviously a trap. Superman questions how they would have reacted if he'd come to Earth in a ship that looked like that. I don't know, probably shit ourselves? Laziness runs through a lot of this game's core and perhaps simply a rush job on the game that has changed forms so many times and needed to be feature complete rather quickly is why we have this this way. There needs to be a reason the League get themselves caught and brainwashed. Fine, that's the theme of the game. They are the villains, we have to kill them. Of all the ways it could have happened, Superman dooming himself and his friends in this moronic way was really the best they could come up with? This is particularly awful when you compare it to the plot of Injustice 2, a much better Brainiac focused story for the record, where Superman knows that Brainiac is responsible for Krypton exploding. A different universe sure, but the clash between the two is really grating. Before we move on I will just mention that this has nothing to do with the performance of the voice actors. This is down to bad writing. Besides Rick Flagg everyone was passable at the very least and most were excellent and I don't particularly like this Brainiac compared to Injustice 2, but the acting meets the personality presented, even if I have issues with said personality. Nolan North does a pretty decent job as Superman, which surprised me. I especially like the cam manner of threatening the Suicide Squad much later in the game when you eventually fight him. It's somehow more intimidating than if you were screaming and shouting at them. Anyway, the game picks up after the League did indeed go to the big scary skull ship to talk and got caught. Flash escaped with Wonder Woman by breaking the sound barrier, but the others weren't so lucky. Batman and Green Lantern are already helping convert the citizens of Metropolis into the army Brainiac is after, and are also keeping the human military out of the city, but Superman is nowhere to be seen. The Suicide Squad break into the Hero Museum part of the Hall of Justice and steal some working technology that was just left on display, including a gauntlet which allows Captain Boomerang to use the Speed Force. They just leave those kind of things sitting around. The display case they get their traversal abilities from is strange even outside of having that technology. Why is Riddler's hat there if Riddler is alive and presumably still has his hat? Why are Nightwing's weapons in there? Why are hero and villain tech mixed together? Why is any of this on display easily reachable outside the inner sanctum and part of a section clearly meant for children? Yada yada, they need technology and traversal stuff to even stand a chance out there. Yeah, yeah, I got it. You've got to get through this garbage somehow and get back to the bland repetitive gameplay I suppose. Those purple glowy bits aren't going to shoot themselves are they? After an embarrassing city tour section where the squad are almost instantly captured and killed by Green Lantern, who explains their evil plans, and also miscategorizes all four of them as metahumans which is very odd. The Flash saves the squad and battles his former friend. Their goal now becomes finding a wounded Flash. They do this rather quickly so we're just going to skim over some parts here but I want to pause now to talk about the woman behind it all and her goals in the city since you'll be hearing her barking orders at you throughout. Yep, we need to talk about the baffling character that is Amanda Waller. Amanda Waller is a bitch. This is on purpose. This is her character and it's how she should be correctly displayed. She treats the squad as expendable assets, she is a hard ass, and she is the living embodiment of the phrase, the ends justify the means. Going so far in that regard that in this game she has a comatose hacker working for her. Viola Davis does an excellent job portraying her in the live action Suicide Squad movies and Deborah Wellison likewise does a decent job here, living up to how the character is supposed to be, at least on some level. I don't really think they needed to scan her likeness into the game since she doesn't really match how Waller is meant to look. Short, fat, but carrying herself with an intimidation factor she can back up from her position of authority. But maybe they did that just to carry on the meme of Wilson's likeness being used in every game she voices someone in, I don't know. 
The problems with Waller come more when you examine her place within the game's logic, plot and progression of events. She is well aware that an alien has invaded Earth and turned our greatest heroes against us. She is aware that most of Metropolis is dead or turned into alien creatures. She is aware that being inside the city is dangerous. Remember all of this. Early on, when the squad meets Wonder Woman for the first time, Waller appears and the two argue. Waller has a rant about humans trusting the Justice League and how misplaced said trust was. This is at odds with the League being mind controlled. It comes across like they turned out bad and were just playing nice as a ruse. It doesn't make any sense. Getting angry at Wonder Woman in this way leads her to declaring to the squad, your new mission is to kill the Justice League. Okay then, what was the mission before that? Stop Brainiac, I suppose but she was aware of at least two League members acting on his behalf, Batman and Green Lantern, before this. She's surprised when she learns early on that the Flash is still human, but isn't surprised that Wonder Woman is. Waller having contempt for the Justice League is perfectly in character, by the way, especially if you were a fan of the old Justice League cartoons, but these little contradictions and inconsistencies within the game's logic, they start to add up when you notice them and it really detracts from her character. It also can't really decide how intimidating they want her to be. When the squad try to have their neck bombs removed at LexCorp, she in an unhinged manner starts beating the apparatus in a way that has her come across completely stupid, weak and unhinged. Granted, this scene has Lex getting one over on her, so this is just an outlet for her anger, I get that, but it starts to separate her from hard ass willing to do anything to save the day to flat out villain. Now there are two ways they could have taken her character. She could actually become a villain, and there's one major hint at that later on we'll get to, but the game does nothing with it. They also could have had her soften and begin to work with the squad as time goes on, but that doesn't happen either. I'm going to end up reiterating this a lot, but everyone, including Amanda Waller, remain static. They are frozen in time. She begins the game as she ends it, a bitch with inconsistent motives and actions. Your friends are slaughtering the people they swore to protect. Batman. Green Lantern, The Flash, and Superman. You're the last one left, Diana. You need to work with us. They have been enslaved by something terrible. Their minds are not their own. I will find a way to bring them back. We will defeat Brainiac and end this madness. Her just leave. She is already gone. Like your courage when you are threatened. Shut up, Shark! She won't do what needs to be done. Can't do it. Too damn honorable. That's where you come in. Task Force X. Your new mission is to kill the Justice League. Back to the so-called plot. The squad capture Flash and, in order to avoid Brainiac and Green Lantern, they take him inside what turns out to be the Batman experience. This section is entirely outside of the main play area of the game that explains the history of the Arkham games and desperately tries to patch logic gaps regarding why on earth Arkham Batman would join the Justice League. Why something like this would exist in Metropolis and be helmed by reporter Jack Ryder, who is, within this universe, based out of Gotham where Batman operated, well, who knows? The name's Ryder. Jack Ryder. The TV reporter? Yeah. You a fan? No. Wouldn't it have made sense for Lois Lane to have narrated this version of this... ride? Attraction? It's based in Metropolis, that would make more sense. It would have been a way to shoehorn her into the game that would have been better than the irritating constant livestream of her survival she has going on. They didn't really think about that, but they didn't really think about much. This section exists for the squad to discover that Batman is working for Team Brainiac and that he is killing people now in rather brutal fashion. We only see him killing the security working the attraction though, not the squad for whatever reason. I'll talk specifically more on this subject a little later on but I'm just going to pop in here to mention that even from the museum in the Hall of Justice at the start of the game where you first start hearing Batman talk, 
it was a sad reminder of Kevin Conroy's passing and his ill health prior. He doesn't command the same presence he did a decade ago, his voice is weaker, strained, and it was genuinely heartbreaking to hear it that way. This point matters more to me than the trash fire of the game being the last we'll hear of him as Arkham Batman. He was a childhood hero and to hear him so audibly ill hurt a great deal. Anyway, this leads to a pretty fun section where you're wandering around in the dark as each character in turn, knowing that Batman is in the room and he is hunting you. It's a reversal of roles from the established games that is good, but it fumbles the landing by not showing you just how terrifying a Batman who kills could be by having him knock out each of the Suicide Squad one at a time instead of, I don't know, stabbing them, breaking their necks or anything in between. Given that three out of the four of the squad are just normal humans, it wouldn't take him much effort and we know that Brainiac has no interest in the squad at this point due to the conversation you overhear between him and Batman when the scene ends. During the Walking in the Dark section you do see cutouts of characters from the Arkham games but you can't interact with them until after this on the rail section is done. Once it is over and the lights come back on you're free to move on if you want or explore the exhibit, museum, attraction, ride. I still don't know what in-universe reason properly explains the existence of this experience or its purpose. Anyway, press some buttons and you hear a familiar reporter spout a recap of past games events. Jack Ryder speaks with a familiarity about the people and events from the Arkham games that we as players would have, but not what a character from within them would have. How much would he really know about Talia al Ghul, for instance? He supposes out of thin air that Arkham Knight fights a lot like Red Hood, but apparently never noticed. Wow, Batman's chin looks a hell of a lot like world famous billionaire Bruce Wayne's. He also inadvertently, and if you blinked or didn't press enough buttons, which I would totally understand to avoid hearing his horrendous impressions, you might have missed this, paints Batman as a murderer. Ryder claims that in the finale of Arkham City, Clayface is killed and if you remember, he only fell in that electrified Lazarus pit because Batman chopped him up with a sword. Still, they have a lot more defiling of the Arkham Batman to do so we'll let this little indiscretion slide like clay into a pit. I'm getting sidetracked off my original point but you can have the squad react to various cutouts and generally just get caught up with the Arkham games. Then it comes to what happened to Batman after Arkham Knight. One button press is all it takes for Ryder to sum up five years of developing plot in voiceover narration. They brush over the after credit scene of Arkham Knight but do confirm that it is Bruce using Fear Toxin to carry on being Batman which makes no sense for so many reasons and bastardizes a lot of the the city needs something more than Batman to protect it arc he goes on towards the end of the game. Then Superman just shows up, he finds Bruce Wayne and convinces him to join the Justice League that I guess he formed at some point. They shake hands while unmasked in a crowd of reporters and I guess that's it. Batman is back and he's in the Justice League now and dealing with global threats instead of street level ones in Gotham. That's your history lesson, that's the Batman experience. Just before the Batman experience section, Captain Boomerang accidentally cuts off Flash's left thumb. Don't ask. This is the first of a few moments though the game has people theorising that the League members we meet and kill are in some fashion clones or something because despite this moment the Flash has his thumb in every other scene that you see him. I'm also aware that Plan DLC confirms that despite dying, Flash and Green Lantern at the very least do come back and there are other plot convenient moments that have the former heroes not complying with established lore from outside the game. What we have here though is something that leads us to a greater conversation about the writers not understanding the flash or super speed. Yes, Boomerang cuts off his thumb and sure maybe in this universe Flash can use his healing powers to grow a finger back, but the reason you never see him missing a finger is because he never lost a finger technically speaking. His character model was never altered. You don't see Boomerang cut off the finger, you just see the severed finger on the floor. The finger is used to access the Hall of Justice Inner Sanctum via the fingerprint scanner so it was needed for convenience and was played for jokes but the cutscenes involving Flash they just use his base model which had all fingers and thumbs firmly attached. That's it. That's why it mysteriously grows back. The greater problem is the speed force. Moving quickly and thinking fast enough to comprehend moving that quickly are just parts of the ridiculously powerful set of skills being a speedster in parts. It isn't unique to this game to handle super speed poorly, but it's so inconsistent here that it's very jarring, especially when one of the playable characters is using knockoff brand speed force. 
The Batman experience ends with Batman about to shoot Harley in the head, foreshadowing the reverse roles they'll find themselves in later, only for a previously unconscious Flash to ram into Bruce at super speed and barely get a slow-mo finger on the fired bullet in time to veer it off course and miss Harley by inches. Batman holds on to Flash and drags him into a tumble, landing on top of him and beating him within an inch of his life, fully intending to kill him until Brainiac orders him to stop. Something moving very, very fast, even from a cold start, generates momentum. Flash should have sent Batman flying across the room from the impact alone, yet he just sort of nudges him? Batman must also have super speed to react to this happening fast enough to grab Barry and drag him into that tumble. The game doesn't really establish a clear way super speed works when impacts happen since later, once he's evil, the Flash smashes into Lex, who's wearing a mechanical armour at the time, and just rips him out of it in less than a second. I understand that Barry's speed force powers are stronger than Captain Boomerang's. Fine. That makes sense. But even having partial super speed powers throws off a lot of the encounters that the group have with Evil Flash as the game progresses. The way Boomerang uses his speed force in general is strange. Through gameplay, he throws his boomerang and then uses super speed to go catch it where it ends up. It's implied in cutscenes that he moves at super speed without doing this sometimes, but this isn't explained. It also somewhat defeats the point of super speed if you have to throw something at normal speed first. This is exemplified later on in a scene where the squad run away. Boomerang is actually the last to leave despite having super speed because he has to throw his boomerang first. Once he comes back evil, Flash could easily kill the squad faster than they could comprehend it happening, but of course he doesn't. Brainiac still doesn't care about them when the Flash is harassing them, he's just toying with them because apparently Barry is a sadistic asshole. I'll talk more about the League's personality seeping through their mind control later because it is important. The point is that it's dangerous and difficult to include super speed in your plot, let alone in a video game. It isn't difficult to spot inconsistent application of the mechanic from one story beat to the next. Flash doesn't send Batman flying across the room because he has to get captured for the story to happen. Flash somehow loses a fight against Green Lantern that happens off camera because the story has to happen. Evil Flash doesn't immediately search the entire city and find the last percent of population in hiding because the story has to happen. Anti-Speed Force technology becomes a key focus of the plot once the Flash does come back evil. The squad eventually uses it to fight him, in the first boss fight in fact. So you know what, let's jump around the story a bit and explore where that comes from. I want to mention Lex Luthor and just in passing really his Earth 2 variant called Lex 2 by the squad that you meet further down the line when the disastrous introduction of a multiverse happens. Arkham Universe Lex exists to hint at a way to beat the Flash and Lex 2 exists to provide a way to kill Superman later on. I don't really want to spend a lot of time on the awfully written character bios you can find in the game archives that pretend to be written from the perspective of Lex Luthor and not just an upset writer with strong opinions, embarrassing agendas and an axe to grind. It takes a lot to make me cringe, but wow, damn did they manage it. Anyway, Lex of the Arkham Universe, Arkham Lex. He's in his green power armour, out somewhere in the city, preparing to go to war against Brainiac and the evil Justice League. Why did it take him three weeks? Shut up. His introduction actually reminded me of a great quote by Lex from one of the animated movies. While fighting Doomsday, he shouts, are we supposed to be impressed that you defeated the Justice League? That happens every other week. The squad meet up with Lex, or rather he traps them in some kind of frozen time bubble. Harley touches Deadshot's arse here in a manner where if the roles were reversed, I doubt we would be expected to laugh. Remember kids, sexual harassment is okay if a woman does it to a man. Lex monologues about saving his city only to be wrenched from his power armour in less than a second by the now evil Flash. There's a lot here in the following section I'm going to unpack later when talking about how the mind control works, so let's just surmise it by saying the squad save Lex but Flash reappears again. While Flash is taunting the squad he rushes Lex at super speed and Lex presses a button on a magic doohickey he has which repels anyone that tries to touch him while at super speed. A very useful bit of technology, shame you have to switch it on and off for reasons unstated. Surely someone who moves faster than thought could get around that pretty easily, right? Flash is thrown into a wreckage of a van by Lex activating this technology and the squad shoot at it until the van explodes. This makes Flash angry. So rather than do what he was ordered to do, which as it turns out was to capture Lex so Batman could interrogate him and work out who has been advising him about the invasion. He kills him in an admittedly pretty cool way, he phases his hand through his chest and pulls out his still beating heart. 
In these actions, he is disobeying Brainiac's orders here. Remember this for later. The introduction of anti-speed force technology is needed to make beating the Flash at all plausible. Fine. Having to switch it on and off isn't. It makes no sense. He gets hurt in the same way later on by Boomerang not using his own super speed mind, pressing an on-off button slowly. The scene concludes with Flash breaking Lexi's technology and leaving. I don't remember why he doesn't just kill the squad before doing so. I think they were hoping you wouldn't ask that question. We can use the existence of anti-speed force technology though as a jumping off point to the side villains the squad work with as the game progresses. So let's move on to that. I was originally going to dedicate this section to talking about the entirety of the support squad, as it's called, which is comprised of Penguin, Hack, Toyman, Gizmo, Poison Ivy, and I guess you could include Aaron Cash and Rick Flagg, but to be honest, I didn't speak to any of them outside of when I was forced to, and they're just reduced to being vendors that hawk unnecessary daily quests, new guns, or upgrades to you. I even forgot who Gizmo was when he made his final appearance in a story mission where he drives around in a terrible looking Batmobile. What I will say is they successfully made Penguin look... uglier? Yay? He sits around in a throne with a picture of his younger but still old self behind him looking like Elton John on his deathbed. Still, I think the one to focus on most is Poison Ivy, now fun-sized, as Harley declares, and she now also appears to resemble someone's half-arsed Baldur's Gate 3 character. Let's cover how and when we last saw Poison Ivy. In Arkham Knight, Batman convinces her to help him clear Gotham of the fear toxin Scarecrow has coded it in. To be honest, I don't really remember why she agrees to do this, and it doesn't feel entirely earned that she suddenly sides with Batman, but it is still a great twist and a good moment in the story. In order to use her plants to clear out most of the toxin, she has to make the ultimate sacrifice and dies in the process. As I say, not entirely earned with context, but still a great moment and a nice send off to her character. If you return to the point of her death after finishing the main story, you see a very strange looking flower there, so it did set up a potential return in some fashion. Lex Luthor being interested in Gotham is also set up, albeit for a Superman project that never came to be, so it's possible he would find the plant. Her being a child also fits the timeline between then and now, and despite that I poked fun at it, she looks like something you would expect, I guess, for someone who is now 100% plant rather than a human with plant-adjacent powers. Her style and appearance doesn't even really stay consistent between each Arkham video game, so it being wildly different here isn't really as big a deal compared to some other problems. When the Suicide Squad talk to Ivy for the first time, it is heavily implied that Harley and Ivy were in a relationship. Harley mentions her being a shoulder to cry on when she was upset at the Joker, or that she once emblazoned the words Harley and Ivy forever on the side of a building, which is confusing. In current comic canon, Poison Ivy and Harley have been a couple for quite some time. This is also filtered into some cartoons as well, but the Arkham Universe is a different beast, and since this game is in the Arkham Universe, ha 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 ha, we must use the inner logic of these games as the history we draw from above all else, something I think the writers may have forgotten. The Arkham Harley, this Harley, apparently, was madly in love with the Joker. She was straight, or I guess bi if you want. She would do anything for him despite how poorly he treated her. They met in Arkham Origins, and she loves him from then not only until he dies, but long after that as well. In Arkham Asylum, Harley barely acknowledges Ivy when they meet because she isn't on Joker's guest list. In Arkham City, it is implied by Catwoman that she and Ivy were in a relationship or at the very least lived together, but during that time Harley was still in love with the Joker and was with him. It is possible that in five years following Arkham Knight she discovered some things about herself, put the Joker behind her and branched out in a different sexual direction, but it certainly wasn't with Ivy because Ivy was dead. It really does come across as a mixing of established canons that don't gel together at all. The Ivy and Harley that exist in comics today are not the Ivy and Harley that exist in the Arkham Universe. They can't be, given the timeline and events of their lives. Whoever wrote Ivy's dialogue also doesn't seem to know what pheromones are. They could mean that Ivy recognises the pheromones that Harley is giving off via sweat or other liquids, but that isn't what she says. It's a flat out mistake or lack of care that's really hard to ignore. During the first meeting with the squad, there's also a moment where Ivy decides to kill them because they're human and thanks to Lex torturing her, she doesn't like humans very much. 
She does this while the squad were distracted, briefly discussing the ethics of planting a neck bomb in a five-year-old because Waller told them to, and that would make her a slave for life. As she's about to go through with her threat of killing them, Captain Boomerang reveals that he's already put a bomb in her neck earlier, presumably using super speed because we're never shown this. Speed of that magnitude would surely be useful anytime Flash attacks them, but oh well. Job done, I guess. Child enslaved. Rick Flagg, who's voiced terribly by an otherwise great actor, swings by and brings the new prisoner back to the Hall of Justice, where she is turned into a vendor that sells you status effect weapons for some reason. She shows up in a mission or two later on, but that was the last and only time I actually directly spoke to her. The squad's sins against children don't end there, however. No, 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 no. So from what I vaguely remember from some old Superman cartoons, Toyman used to be super creepy and was quite effective as a villain to the Man of Steel as a result of the unsettling things he'd do, despite obviously never being able to match up to the Kryptonian's strength. They didn't exactly do Toyman justice in this game by turning him into a walking deus ex machina. Toyman just turns up at the Hall of Justice while the crew is struggling to find a way to defeat the newly revealed to be Brainiac controlled Flash. What? A small child avoided the corrupted Justice League, the army that's out there, ignored Lois Lane's broadcasts saying get the hell out, it's super dangerous here. No, no, Toyman just decides to go to the Hall of Justice for some reason. Everyone expects an enemy as the doors open, but is surprised to see a small Japanese child walk in with his pet robot. Waller, being as unhinged as she is, immediately sees this random child and decides, well, I should probably put a bomb in that, since, as we discover, bombs are her answer to everything, and instructs Captain Boomerang to do so. This is so it can be revealed in dramatic fashion that Toyman has developed anti-speed force technology. The hows and the whys of this, especially given that he states the Flash is his hero, are never addressed. He has anti-speed force tech, and that means he's useful. Toyman wants to save the Justice League, and Waller tricks him into believing that this is their goal too. He willingly joins them and agrees to help, offering up his technology to the Suicide Squad with no resistance. This is quickly followed by Boomerang implanting a bomb in Toyman's neck. This is the second child he's put a bomb into within an hour. I guess Waller did order him to do it, but Toyman did not require coercion to help them, nor is he a criminal in this universe, at least not yet. He's there willingly, or perhaps even more willingly, than Rick Flagg and his team of hapless soldiers. I'm really not sure what the point of that was. We later learn that Waller wants to use Brainiac's technology to control all life on the planet. What? No, I'm not joking. Though it is only mentioned once, and then is completely forgotten about. So it can't be about having control of Toyman, since her end game is to have control of everyone via other means. Even once he learns the goal of the squad is to kill the corrupted Justice League, Toyman just kind of goes with it. No coercion is ever needed at any point for him to help the squad. Is it just to make Waller look more evil? It doesn't seem to dwell on the act at all and tries to make a joke out of it when Toyman asks, oh, is this some kind of initiation right after it happens? Is it to make Boomerang seem more evil? Or perhaps in a somewhat abstract way shows he's still a coward and will do whatever it takes to save himself, even if that means Waller ordering him to implant a bomb in a child for the second time since breakfast. It is a very strange moment, and the true intent of it story-wise feels so vague. It almost seems like a puff of smoke or a wave of a cape. Part of a magic trick to make you think things are happening and that the plot is progressing, but no. Nothing is progressing, at least not in a way that makes coherent sense. A lot of the time the game has things happen that seem to be for the setup to a punchline that really comes close to landing. This might just be another example of that, I don't know. Then there's the anti-speed force technology that Toyman invented. It isn't always on, much like Lexi's version from earlier in the game, which renders it completely useless if it were treated properly against the speedster. The Flash could kill you in the space of time it takes you to press a button, that's for sure. He could steal the damn button in the time it takes you to consider using it. You could argue that this isn't the case for Boomerang, given he sort of has speed force powers, but this is widely inconsistent in how it's used and what scope it has. Toyman's version of the technology needs to be powered up by residual speed force energy or particles, I don't really remember what the game said, maybe Barry Allen's sweat, something, which is an excuse for a mission to go collect what you need so that all the squad are protected. Hang on though, Captain Boomerang's been using the speed force, or at least some kind of bastardized and twisted version of it for the whole damn game thus far, but this isn't mentioned. 
Surely they could just have him run circles around the Hall of Justice, siphoning it from him as he went, couldn't they? We'll never know. We simply have to accept that taking a second child into indentured servitude for Waller has resulted in the squad being given the means to finally kill one of the Justice League. The Flash is the first proper boss fight in the game. I've already moaned about having to press a button to protect yourself from the Speed Force, so I'll spare you going back over that yet again. Let's just accept, as the game does, that the squad are now immune to Flash touching them. He can't get near them, so he engages at range, shooting lightning and whirlwinds, and within the fight you have to counter shot him to keep your technology charged, so I guess it is always on, and whatever. Dipping back into gameplay for hopefully the last time, I just want to mention that every boss fight in this game is tedious. They go on far too long, with the Superman fight being the worst offender. Boomerang's speed force powers do nothing, you're not even allowed to use your abilities in any boss fights, and it isn't brought up at all. Hope you enjoyed the flash fight by the way, because Brainiac fights you in the exact same way. I am not joking, it is literally the same fight. Let's skip ahead to the end of the fight. The Suicide Squad has done it! Barry falls to the floor dead, having been riddled with enough bullets that he has succumbed to his wounds. This is the first moment we get to see a hero die, who is previously within this game, save the squad at least twice. At this point I feel I should mention that this is not a surprise that in a game called Kill the Justice League that you get to do that very thing. The levity the game approaches this with would have been acceptable from a standalone game without providence. The outrage felt by many comes from their mistreatment of the Arkham Batman specifically, the one that has been with us for so long. Flash, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, we know them from outside of the game from other media, but within this universe we don't, so even if the humour is crass, the game can take that tone with their deaths, if it so chooses. Flash dying prompts Captain Boomerang to live out his fantasy of pissing on the hero's corpse. <laughs> Due to a cutaway, I'm not really sure if he does, but the scene then becomes about the squad complimenting Captain Boomerang on the size of his magnificent penis. Master Bruce, are you all right, sir? I'm tired, Alfred. Harley even salutes it. The tonal whiplash is, I can only assume, on purpose. It has to be a signal to the player, hey, we don't take this shit seriously, so don't either, okay? Mission failed. The attempts at humour and misunderstanding the basic grounds for humour infect the entire game. One scene does not match the next in tone or levity. Pissing on a dead hero for some unseen slight in the past isn't on its own funny. A character having a big dick isn't either. These childish actions and observations could be used as the basis for jokes, but it doesn't feel like the game usually tries or when it does, rarely does it work. The wordplay and joke structure throughout is just appalling. Really the only humour that worked for me was visual humour. The game seemed to do that pretty well, which was a surprise. It isn't even a style of comedy I usually like, but here I did. A sombre moment of reflection between King Shark and Wonder Woman ends with her placing a hand on his shoulder and then gently sliding him out of the way so she can leave without saying a word. That was as close to a laugh as the game got out of me. Juxtaposition like that between two opposing emotions or tones can work, but not in the way the game usually tries to achieve it. I did forget to mention, but shortly before the flash fight, Wonder Woman captures him and holds him with her lasso of truth, demanding an answer to how she can stop what's happening. The squad is there for this moment, standing still and just watching as they do for 90% of cutscenes in the game, when Barry breaks free of the mind control for just long enough to tell Wonder Woman that the only way to save the world is to kill them. He hasn't been under Brainiac's control for long, so this moment of weakness is plausible within the plot. This sets up her character for the rest of the game as well, and I guess explains her slightly exaggerated contempt for the squad, since they want to kill the Justice League and keep suggesting that she team up with them to do so. Anyway, following Flash's death, the group escape into a different universe because a portal just somewhat randomly opens up. It can't be Lex 2 doing it based on what we discover once we're through there, so I don't know. Either way, this is where we discover Lex 2, where the squad forget to ask him to remove their bombs, away from Waller's prying eyes because they do confirm that she cannot see what they're doing on Earth 2 and where we get a glimpse of an alternative world where Brainiac has already won, Earth is lost and the squad don't give a shit. I think it's about time we spoke just a little bit about Brainiac's mind control and the corruption of the Justice League. It isn't how these things are normally portrayed in media. It reminds me a little bit of the Marvel Zombies comic, where 
Despite now being undead flesh eaters, the cast of heroes basically maintained their exact personality quirks. Very strange. The Corrupted Justice League have personality. They have emotions, and these emotions influence their actions. Batman almost beat Flash to death. Flash kills Lex out of anger despite that being directly against his orders. Green Lantern is sad when he sees that you've killed the Flash. Superman is disgusted when he discovers that you've killed Batman. Over radio communications throughout the game you hear that Flash is angry that Batman is in charge of the invasion. They are not mindless zombies who instantly do what they're told. They're still in there but their world view has been skewed to follow Brainiac's desires. This somewhat detracts from the you're fighting clones argument because you see part of who they are and how they act even when evil, but it also muddies the waters with how Brainiac's control actually works. What extra benefit does it impart and what limitations does it have? Certain people will take longer to acclimate to it, seemingly, because Flash is converted in hours but Superman takes over three weeks. Some have their weaknesses removed and some don't. The League displaying their personalities such as they are despite being evil also contributes to the disgust felt at how their deaths are treated by the game. While I don't really like that Barry is acting like his live action movie self, you can still see him in there even once he's evil. The squad not even acknowledging that he saved them multiple times does not suggest that it's because they're villains, but rather because the writers just forgot or got distracted by big dick jokes. I think the lasso scene with Wonder Woman is there, so despite all that, the game wants you to know this is the only way. The Justice League have to die, fine, but they don't have to die without respect or as the butt of a bad joke. Oh, but that reminds me, there is one death treated with the respect it deserves. For the most part, I like how Wonder Woman is portrayed in this game. She looks a bit odd, like an older actress trying to play younger, but her strength of character shines through. She believes she can save her friends, that is her folly. She will not listen to reason, and this ultimately leads to her death. The squad interactions with her vary wildly in tone. She saves them from the Flash, she saves them from the hulking brute monster type, she saves them from Superman, she keeps saving them but also talks with audible contempt every time they converse. I might be giving the game more credit than it deserves here but I think the reason she so clearly dislikes them is not because of their asinine criminal pasts but rather that deep down she knows that they represent the only way to win. They've embraced killing the mind controlled league whereas she just can't let go of hope. I don't know, maybe it's more credit than it deserves like I said, but the only person to go on a journey in this game to any degree is Wonder Woman. She capitulates eventually and does try and kill Superman. This completes her arc through the story and she gets a fitting send off soon after. The only one treated with respect, but also the only one fully in control of her actions, mistakes and all. It's as close to the game gets as a through story for anyone. I'll come back to Wonder Woman's final scene soon, but let's briefly cover Green Lantern since the ending of his boss fight sets up the only strong story moment the game has and quickly squanders. At some point in the previous five years, the Justice League fought with the Green Lantern Corps and that led to the creation of pseudo yellow lantern rings that sapped the willpower of Green Lanterns. Yeah, I know this isn't how it really works but we're working on the logic presented within the game and that's how it works here. With these rings the squad are able to challenge Green Lantern and after some more oddly uncomfortable dialogue between Lantern and Deadshot the second overlong boss fight kicks off. You know let's just skip to the end of the fight. Green Lantern has been shot to death as with every other boss. He's still breathing though which lets Deadshot get in one last botched line before he shoots Green Lantern in the head. The line, didn't you hear? Gunshot. We're out on parole does not work. In the game it's so King Shark can utter, we are not. But it would have been more dramatic as a full stop if it had gone, didn't you hear? We're out on parole. Gunshot. You could still have King Shark do the follow up funny line and you could have Deadshot shrug since he doesn't care because Green Lantern is dead now. Basic comedy beats like this are just off, they're just slightly off. Anyway, once he's dead, the group note that all the Green Lantern constructs around the city are still standing. During their conversation about this, King Shark pulls the ring from Green Lantern's finger and places it on his own. Now, I know this is not usually how lanterns work in the comic, yes, yes, I know. But even in comics, it can be inconsistent, like in Deceased, 
the ring flies from Zombie Green Lantern and chooses Black Canary as its new owner, but in DC vs Vampires spoilers, Green Lantern retains his ring and murders multiple innocent people as a vampire. This is why we have to adhere to the logic of the story presented in this universe, even if we don't like it. In this universe, the rings do not choose their bearers and stay with them even if mind controlled. That is the logic the game goes by. In a pretty fun scene that follows King Shark now with the power of Green Lantern temporarily, before I guess the ring overpowers him, not quite sure what happened, he summons a giant green shark and it flies into the force field surrounding Brainiac's skull ship. This cracks a hole in an otherwise thus far impenetrable shield. This goes into one section of the game that could have worked so very well if they didn't just fuck it up. In stories, growth is important. It doesn't need to be a hero's journey, it just needs to end up somewhere different to where it began based on the lessons and experiences learned throughout. Had the scene with King Shark breaking open Brainiac's shield not come roughly an hour and a half before the end of the game, no I'm not exaggerating, it sat poised for the perfect turning moment, the moment when everything changes and the characters start to develop. In the game, Amanda Waller cuts in over the radio and thanks the squad for what they've done. She says their sentences will be commuted posthumously. At that moment, we see a nuke launch from, I think, near the Hall of Justice, heading straight for Brainiac's ship. This is a great moment. It seems like everything is over. Waller has taken the ultimate step to stop Brainiac by nuking his ship, taking a portion of the city out with it, while it has a weakness. It doesn't happen, though, because Superman catches the nuke. The best mission in the game starts now, which is surprising given that it's just an escort mission. Superman takes the nuke away, comes back shortly after, and starts fighting with Wonder Woman, who is now armed with a kryptonite-infused shield. Waller, for no real reason other than to give you an excuse to walk around the city, shouts over the radio that she's pinned down on her way back to the Hall of Justice and orders the squad to save her, stating that if she dies, their bombs will go off. As you proceed through the mission, meeting up and saving Waller, taking her to the Hall of Justice, Superman and Wonder Woman fight constantly and they stay in frame. They're zooming around the city, they're fighting in the sky, you see lasers, you see them smashing through buildings. You really get a feel for the scale of their combat between a literal god and what might as well be a god. The squad get Waller to the Hall of Justice steps, but just as they do, Wonder Woman smashes down nearby, clearly losing the fight against mind-controlled Superman. Much like the rest of the game, the squad stand and watch while other people do the game. Waller screams at them to take her inside, though I'm not really sure why she thinks that would make her safe from Superman. Oh well. The squad ignore Waller and watch as Wonder Woman loses the fight. As it looks like Superman is about to strike the final blow, a boomerang bops him on the side of the head. He angrily looks at Captain Boomerang, who accuses King Shark of being the one who threw it. Pretty funny, and clever, if you think about it too much, which I have. This is Boomerang's way of showing admiration for Wonder Woman. The rest of the squad do it vocally, as or after she dies. He does it by fruitlessly trying to save her from her inevitable death. The split second of distraction gives Wonder Woman time to take a shard of her shattered kryptonite shield and stab Superman through the heart. Rather than instantly killing him, this only slows him down before he fires Brainiac infused eye lasers or something, not sure, into her with enough force that he passes her indestructible bracers and strikes her through the chest. He stumbles to the floor, clearly hurt, before flying back to Brainiac's ship, presumably to heal, at super speed. We have the only sombre moment in the game now as Wonder Woman dies, uttering that the kryptonite should have killed Superman. The squad here at this moment should have grown as characters. The person who saved them, at least twice as well, died trying to protect them and everyone else again. 
The strength of this moment should also have affected Waller. She was there, she saw it happen. And it does, it just, it doesn't go far enough. The squad and Waller just saw a god die and a mind-controlled alien demigod survive his only known weakness. We cut inside to the Hall of Justice. Waller is visibly, but not audibly, shaken. She collapses into a chair, she smokes a cigarette, she puts her head in her hand, she repeats, it should have killed him. You can tell that she's realising just how fucked they all are. What can they do against a Superman that has no weakness? This moment is fantastic, it's the best cutscene in the game and does a lot with visual storytelling rather than with words. I don't even mind the sort of humour that follows when Boomerang via Lex 2 prompting him by earpiece suggests something that might actually work against Superman. Waller just kind of grunts, sure, whatever. She's given up. This moment is the low point for the... Yeah, I guess we'll say heroes, I suppose. But with just over an hour of video game left, there's no room to grow from this point. The squad could have become more focused on their goals. They could have shown that their resolve is now stronger. They want to avenge Wonder Woman. Waller could have realised that only by working together would they have any hope of winning and that sometimes just being a hard ass isn't good enough. The ingredients are all there, but the soup pot's burned and you've got half the cooking time you need. It's such a shame that one, this excellent moment happens way too far down the line, and two, nothing is done with it. After this scene, everything goes back to normal, I'm not kidding. It's like it didn't happen. Hell, even some of the things you see damaged during the cutscene don't look right when you're back exploring the game world afterwards. It is truly an utter waste of anything as close to serviceable as this game could manage. Oh well, compliments over. Let's move on. I'm sorry, Kello. It's Jesus. Don't try to talk. It should have killed him. He'll recover. Be prepared. Shark, help me carry her in. We got medics inside. Thought the four of you couldn't achieve anything. Prove me wrong. She's probably just bushed. Right? Her heart has stopped beating. You went out like you lived, doll. Looking sharp. And never listening to us. <coughs> what the hell do we do now? Task Force X, get inside. <sighs> Thank you.
Lex 2's plan is to capture Batman alive and use his body to invent gold kryptonite. I didn't really follow how this works, but this video is already way too long. Just, just run with it. You need to find the Batcave in Metropolis, which inexplicably exists, and do so via a gizmo escort mission that I mentioned earlier. Yes, an escort mission follows on from an escort mission. I wasn't joking when I said there's exactly two types of mission with only slight variation. When you find the Batcave, you see a pre-recorded message from Batman with instructions for Robin on what to do if the League, or himself, are ever compromised. He tells Tim to find Nightwing, Oracle, and Jason. So this is the Arkham Universe, right? Wink wink, nudge nudge. So why is he telling Tim to find his wife? Wouldn't Tim know where his wife is? Or did the writers just forget that Tim, Barbara, aka Oracle, are married now in this universe? Why would they need to find Nightwing anyway? His weapons are in the museum at the start of the game, so clearly he's been around. If Jason is still out there murdering people, as I suppose at the top of the video, wouldn't the Justice League have stopped him by now since they're pretty anti-murder? Ugh, I, I, I don't know. This is another scene that exists for players of the previous games rather than for the service of this one, I think. This is a heartfelt goodbye from Bruce to Tim, who he calls son even though in this universe I don't think he ever adopted Tim like he did in the comics, but you know. It isn't needed, I don't think it's wanted, and it's ruined by bad humour and what follows. This part of the scene concludes with King Shark finding Tim's bloodied Robin mask on the floor. There's no body, but the implication is that Tim is dead, and Bruce being as thorough as he is, I doubt he would have left the rest of the Bat family alive to potentially get in the way, so did he go hunt them down too? In the comics, when the Batman Who Laughs turns into his namesake, he lures the entire Bat family to his Batcave and he shoots them all to death. Well, either way, this is just so we can get to the third boss fight of the game, the Batman boss fight, and boy does it suck! If you're playing solo, you have to go through this section four times, where Fear Gas is pumped into the cave and Harley tells you to release some valves or something. During this section, Batman is hunting you again, but this time you see him as the demon from the post credit scene of Arkham Knight. At one point, he uses the voice synthesizer from Arkham Knight to trick Deadshot into going somewhere else. He does grab him, but doesn't kill him for some reason. I guess Brainiac does want them alive now. I think Batman said something to this effect. I was kind of losing my my patience with the game by this point. As the gas overcomes the squad, we get another Deus Ex Machina, where Harley reveals that in Arkham Asylum, the gibbering wreck that Scarecrow became gave her just enough information, along with the degree she got in chemicals, or whatever. What? Let her formulate her own super fear gas. Yep, she's now better at making this kind of thing than Scarecrow, Batman, and Joker, so, although the squad are under the influence of Batman's fear toxin, he's now under the influence of Harley's. It's monumentally stupid, but it's so we can have an abstracted boss battle against a building-sized Batman in a callback to the Scarecrow sections of Arkham Asylum. In the reality that we don't see, they're presumably just having a normal fight, but this is to make it more dramatic, so I'll let it slide. They capture a near-dead Batman, and they take him back to Lex 2 so he can create the gold kryptonite, which brings us to the end game. Yes, really. There's one proper mission left once the kryptonite is formulated. The squad's plan is to lure a still injured Superman back out by carrying out a public execution of Batman because that is apparently something that we all wanted to see. Look on the mask with my boy. I know this section is called Superman, but we have to talk a little bit more about Batman first. This game pretends to be in the Arkham Universe, so the scene that follows is the Arkham Batman, who already had a fair send-off in Arkham Knight, being executed for our entertainment. Arkham Knight completed his story and left the world open to tell others. Now instead, we see that his story in fact did not end there, but ends on a park bench where an unrepentant Harley Quinn shoots him in the fucking head after a terrible, terrible monologue. This is the true end to the Batman many people grew to love over the trilogy of great games. Granted, he may pop up again via DLC, but that isn't presented here. No, here we simply get to watch the only character we have any investment in being executed by a twat. It's never a good thing when it feels like a scene exists simply to piss off fans. The problem with this is not that Batman dies. The game is called Kill the Justice League, and he dies all the damn time in comics and cartoons, whatever. It's the manner in which his death is treated that is so appalling. 
Who came up with this idea? Who okayed this being how the Arkham Batman goes out? It is baffling. Just off the top of my head, how about Harley's fear toxin brings back some lucidity to him? Maybe he breaks free from the park bench, attacks them, but he gets dosed with the fear gas again, and in a few seconds of clarity, he tells Harley to take him out. She can still do it without remorse, if that's how you want the bitch to come across, but give the hero we know one last chance to sacrifice himself for the greater good. We already have seen with the Flash that Brainiac's control can be weakened, even if it's only for seconds. This would not have been out of place. I'm not going to pretend to hide my bias that this end to the character especially hurts given Kevin Conroy's passing. The man voiced a childhood hero of mine and in later life even recorded a birthday message to me during the pandemic when I wasn't in a good headspace and it helped me through it. I'm aware this is reality bleeding into fiction, but also now knowing he was probably already ill while still doing these things for his fans shows what a good person he was. And while he is not Batman, they are different people, hearing his strained performance in this game end with an unrepentant gunshot made me sick to my stomach. Shame on them for this, whoever is responsible. Anyway, killing Batman does indeed draw out Superman from Brainiac ships, so the final unique boss fight of the game begins. Despite taking place in a large open park, there are invisible walls literally everywhere to keep you in the centre only. Superman zips around throwing tanks and cars and zapping you and using ice breath, and all these attacks in manners that really should have killed normal people, gold kryptonite or not. Yes, the gold kryptonite is weakening him and making him susceptible to bullets. They don't actually say it weakens his powers, and they're just normal people, three out of the four of them. So what's going on here? Well, either way, it drags and it drags and it drags and as a side note, this is literally the only point in which I died in the game and it was because of the invisible walls. Eventually, even the Man of Steel cannot withstand the enormous amount of plot armour the Suicide Squad has and dies from his new weakness, bullets. Yes, bullets. Why didn't he just eye laser them from... No, 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 fuck it. Who cares anymore? This is treated without much fanfare, which actually is genuinely funny. No one gives a shit that you just killed a god. I think Rick Flagg says something to the effect of, oh hey, you killed Superman, good job TFX, which is the general tone from most of the NPCs. All that stands between you and victory is Brainiac. Or is it? Not so funny now, is it, dickhead? This game hoped to be around for a while. It almost certainly will not be, but it planned numerous seasons of content ahead of its release. This means they can't really wrap things up because... content. After farming for a resource to launch a raid on Brainiac, you go and you fight the big alien twat himself. For no apparent reason, besides laziness, he literally turns into the Flash so you can do the Flash boss fight again, and future content teases imply eventually it will be random and he could also become Green Lantern, or maybe Superman. They they do know that Brainiac can fight, right? I know he's called Brainiac, but... Uh, see Injustice 2 for more examples of this. Anyway, they beat Brainiac slash Flash whatever, and Amanda Waller gets to stick a thing in his brain that actually finishes him off. Job done, except not really. Earlier in the game, Lex 2 deduces that 13 Brainiacs are working together across multiple universes to bring back his homeworld in each by terraforming Earth. He even says this to the squad one of the two times outside of radio calls he actually directly speaks to them. The prospect of killing 12 more Brainiacs excites the Suicide Squad for some reason, so they finally successfully high-five. A running joke I didn't bother mentioning. And the credits roll. As far as having to leave a game open-ended, they could have just faced the task of clearing up Brainiac's army. So it's odd they've gone with multiple versions of him, but this also opens up the prospects of multiple versions of heroes or villains, which is why multiverses suck. The first DLC character being added is the Joker. Not the Arkham Joker, obviously. A more compliant Joker who works with the Suicide Squad, with a different personality, different voice, and an umbrella as his traversal mechanic. Sorry, Penguin, I guess that's the Joker's thing now. What? This garbage is their long game for keeping the money flowing in, and we already know it isn't going to work, it hasn't worked, so let's just cut to the damn chase and end this nightmare for all of us.
I don't know who this game was for. Yeah, it, it's easy to say executives making bad money-minded decisions are to blame, but that isn't a good enough explanation. There's something off about every aspect. The graphics, the performance, the characters, the pacing, the story, the tone. Everything's off by just enough to be really distracting. Comedy is subjective. You may have found this game funnier than I did, but I hope that even if you did find it funny, you'd admit that how the jokes are presented rarely work within context. There's a difference between sharing quips while fighting and pissing on a corpse with your gigantic cock. While comedy is subjective, the basic structure and progression of a plot really isn't. You can tell the story you want, of course, but it has to be going somewhere and it has to mean something. For these live service games, I'm sure gameplay is meant to be more important, but there will always be weirdos like me who want a story to hang our hat on, especially when it involves these kind of characters. If you're going to go to the extreme of murdering the Justice League, you have to make their deaths mean something. To use a poor analogy in a different IP, I feel like the writers of this game were aiming for Guardians of the Galaxy, and they ended up with Thor Love and Thunder. And I'll reiterate just one last time that it isn't because the Justice League dies. This happens every other week, to paraphrase Lex Luthor. You can kill them if you like, just make the damn story good. When you have no story to care about, no humour that for me personally worked, no gameplay worth remembering and absolutely no interest in any planned seasons or DLC, you're left with one of the largest falls from grace ever seen. This may well bury what's left of Rocksteady and for what they've produced here, regardless of who is actually to blame, they deserve this fate. To have waited a decade since Arkham Knight to see what else Rocksteady could do and for Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League to be all they could muster together with some glued duct tape and crumbs from behind the sink is shameful. Truly shameful. Wow, this ended up a lot longer than I thought. It took a great deal of time to write and put this together. It's very different to anything I've done in video form on this channel before, but nevertheless was a far more enjoyable experience than playing through this turd was. I'll tell you that for free. Please do show your support if you would like to see me perhaps do this kind of thing again, uh, should the occasion warrant it. And thank you for making it to the end if you did. Once again, my name has been Flick. Thank you for listening to me blather. Do not buy this game. Do not play this game for all the reasons and more, I'm sure, that I've already gone over. Until next time, ta-ta for now. Master Bruce, are you all right, sir? I'm tired, Alfred. Well, I shouldn't wonder. You've taken no meals today. I can't recall when you last slept. A weary body can be dealt with, but a weary spirit, that's something else. Sometimes, old friend, I wonder if I'm really doing any good out there. How can you doubt it? The lives you've saved, the criminals you've brought to justice. I've put out a few fires, yes. Won a few battles. But the war goes on, Alfred. On and on. <laughs>